Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Could we all stand and give the Lord a hand clap of praise as we enter into his presence this evening? Hallelujah. Jesus, we love you and we give you glory. We give you honor. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, the Holy Ghost is already moving in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we worship you. We give you honor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. There's a scripture on my heart during prayer. It's one of my favorites about Jesus. Isaiah 9 and 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called... I just want to stop there. His name is wonderful. Jesus is wonderful. Hey, we got a lot of stuff going on, a lot of things that can confuse us and distract us, but we need to come back to the fact that Jesus is just simply wonderful. And I wonder if we could start this service off tonight just by telling him how good he is. Come on, you don't have to think too hard or go too far to say something good about Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for giving me breath in my body. Thank you, Lord, for giving me my right mind. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for showing kindness. Come on, let's lift him up. Tell him how good he is. Go ahead, love him. Tell him how great he is. Go ahead. Hallelujah. 
I wish somebody who felt that burning fire would just give a shout unto God right now. Lift up his name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, like a raging fire, let it burn. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Anybody thankful for a faithful God? Amen. A faithful Savior. Amen. He's never failed me once. He's never walked out on me. He's never turned his back on me. He never left me when I was down. Come on, we serve a faithful Savior. Hallelujah. He's always faithful, but sometimes our old humanity gets in the way. The Bible doesn't say walk by sight and everything's going to be all right. That's a good sermon title. Right? <laughs> it rhymes at least. It says walk by faith and not by sight because sometimes the way things look is real ugly. Sometimes things look really bad. Sometimes things look really scary. But even still, our God is faithful. He says, don't even worry about what it looks like. It's going to be okay because I'm walking with you. Come on, somebody. You've been here before, and he got you through last time. Nothing has changed. We walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. I believe our God wants to perform a miracle in this place. I believe he has and he is continuing to do so. Amen. And we want to give him that opportunity even now. So if we could put our needs on the screen, I want to share a quick testimony with you. I want you, want you all to make sure you, you keep Brother Fontenot in prayer. Um, he, he's not with us tonight, but he was here this morning. He need, he's in need of healing in his body, Brother Fontenot. Make sure you lift him up. Uh, I walked up to him after service just to hug on his neck and tell him I love him. And he was telling me about what was going on, how he wanted to make sure that we prayed. And I said, yes, sir, we're going to pray. His wife grabbed me by, by the hand, she, and she started to tell me. She said, I want to let you know that I came up for prayer. My hand was hurting so bad. It hurt so bad. I couldn't, I couldn't hold it. I couldn't close it. It, it just hurt, and, and I got prayer. And God healed my hand. I don't have any pain in my hand. <laughs> That's a woman of faith. She never said, oh, woe is me. My husband needs healing. No, she remembered God healed my hand. He can sure enough heal my husband. <laughs> Amen. If you've got a need in this place tonight, it may be a, you may need a physical healing in your body. You may need some emotional healing in your mind and in your heart. I want to invite you to come down. This we're, we're, we're calling this a step of faith. If you need something from the Lord and you, you, you want God to touch you, we invite you to come on down and we'll pray that prayer of faith. God will heal you. He will minister to that need. Amen. If you want to stay where you are, I encourage you, just lift your hand. The Lord knows the need. He'll meet with you. But church, this is a time of faith and this is a time of unity. So let's get behind one another. Let's get behind these needs. And let's command healing and peace over each and every one of them right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we believe you're a healer. We believe there is nothing outside of your reach, God. Bring healing. Bring peace into these situations right now.
Come on, church, let's pray right now. Lift them up. thank him right now for being a prayer answering God hallelujah let's thank him right now for touching us for healing us for being a way maker and an ever present help in time of need Jesus we love you hallelujah we thank you amen if God has ever healed you before raise your hand Bible says he's the same yesterday today and forevermore the same Amen. He was a healer. He is a healer, and he will continue to be a healer. Amen. Amen. You may say, Brother Carr, what do you say about those who ultimately pass from this life to the next because of their ailment, their cancer, whatever it might be? They're, it got the best of them. I beg to differ with you. No, it didn't. Because this life is just a transition to the next life. This life is the work and the faith and the requirement that we put in to live according to His Word to get to the other side. And maybe God chooses to take us out or have us leave this life with cancer or heart disease, whatever it might be. The devil didn't kill you with that. He doesn't have the power to do that. Amen. And we got to trust God in each and every situation. I've said this story before. Me and Sister Wendy had a conversation. And Sister Wendy, the worst thing that could happen is you die and go to heaven. She started laughing on the other end of the phone. She said, Brother Carr, you're absolutely right. What a punishment. Oh, turn to your neighbor and say, I serve a good God. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Brother Burns, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You have blessed us tremendously. Amen. Appreciate so dearly your ministry, your friendship, your kindness. This is just a, a real man. There was no charade. There was no front. Amen. That he puts up. I love and appreciate that about a man of God that will just be real. So thankful for his ministry. He'll be preaching tonight. Heading home in the morning. I want to 
to say thank you to your family for giving you up on Father's Day to be here with us and be a blessing to us. Amen. Amen. I want to remind you this week, don't forget Tuesday at 10 is prayer here in the church. Amen. The parlor, I want to encourage you to come if you're available. Tuesday night will begin at 7 in the prayer room. And let's expect God to do something great in the house of the Lord. Thursday evening, amen, we're going back to ministry development uh, at 7 p.m. in the fellowship hall. All of those who feel like God has something for you from a ministry perspective, I want to encourage you to be there during that time of prayer and, and training and, and, and teaching. Also, at 7 p.m. in the parlor is a powerful time of ladies' prayer where they get in there. And the analogy I have of it is they're just chasing and scalping devils. I mean, they're, they're going after it. And, and there is nothing worse than a mother bear robbed of her cubs or thinking she's about to be robbed of her cubs. And there's nothing more dangerous than some ladies uh, in the Holy Ghost get together and they feel like they're going after the enemy who's trying to take... Amen. Something from them. So I want to encourage you, ladies, if you're available, 7 p.m. prayer in the parlor. Amen. Saturday, July 4th, we will have a church picnic and fellowship here on the grounds. I want to encourage you to be here for that. It begins at 5 p.m. We'll have the barbecue there. Make sure you have your calendars marked for the Power of One Singles Conference. Amen. This is going to be a great, great event. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need to be there. They might say, well, I'm not single. So that's all right. You still need to be there. Amen. I want to encourage you to be there for that. Brother Carl McLaughlin, who has blessed us. Man, this man can teach. This man can preach. He throws out little nuggets that are like just so rich and, and, and beneficial to us in our spiritual lives. I want to encourage you to do that. Amen. Would you stand with me right now? We're going to go to the Lord in our offering. Amen. In our worship and giving back unto him. Amen. I want you to give as the Lord has so blessed you. Amen. And we're going to go into a song right now, but I want us to pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your faithfulness, your goodness to us. We ask you, O oh God, to bless this offering, bless the gift and the giver, Lord. Give wisdom to the ministry and the leadership of the church to use these funds as you would direct and lead in God. We love you. We magnify you. Would you clap your hands unto the Lord as you worship?
you praise the name of Jesus? Hallelujah, Jesus. We lift you up, Lord. We magnify you. We glorify you. Hallelujah, Jesus.
service where I take for granted the presence of the Lord, that we can feel Him like we do. We can sing about Him in the way that we sing and be checked out. I don't ever want to get to the place where I'm just, just here, just, just here. I want to be thankful that I've walked into the presence of the Lord. I'm thankful that I don't have to take the blood of bulls and goats and sprinkle it on the altar and only be only the high priest that could go where the glory was behind the veil. But I'm thankful that when Jesus died on the cross that that veil was rent from top to bottom. I'm thankful that I can boldly come before the throne of grace. Woo! I'm thankful that I can come with my hands raised, with my mouth open, with my heart ready and hungry for the touch of the Holy Ghost. We're a privileged people. Yes, we are. We're a privileged people to be able to experience the power of God like we feel. There's a lot of people that give their right arm to feel what we feel right now in this building. A lot of people would die. They'd do everything they could just to know there was a God that was real, that they could feel the very presence and Shekinah glory of God. I think we ought to praise Jesus like we mean it right now. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I bless your name, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hey, bro, I, I, watched, I, watched, I watched the Lord touch you this morning in a tremendous way. You know how you're going to make it? Look at me. You know how you're going to make it? You're going to have to keep on coming to church to keep on doing Every day, everything's going to be okay. I've learned if I can just somehow put aside whatever I got to put aside and, and let Shane just get to the side and get beyond Shane, I've learned that if I can just get into the presence of the Lord, better is one day. Better is one day in his courts than a thousand elsewheres. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. If I've got to kill my pride, so be it. I want to get into the presence of the Lord. If I don't like the singing, who cares? i got to get into the presence of the Lord. If I don't like your style of preaching, who cares? I've got to do whatever i got to do to get in the presence of the Lord. You got to pick up enough manna for the day. You got to go gather it up. Be a partaker of the supernatural thing and put it to your lips and say, God, I need your word today. And I got to be with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. If you can get in the presence of God, you can survive. Yes, you can. Hallelujah. The old song says, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." Amen. Amen. I feel a little bit honorary tonight. Help me, Holy Ghost. <laughs> Amen. Turn to your neighbor tell him, I'm so glad you look better than I do. <laughs> Amen. Somebody got some brownie points in the house. Amen. <laughs> Amen. John chapter number six. John chapter number six. Thank you so much for your response. Amen. To the word of the Lord, your hunger and worship. 
responding to what the Holy Ghost has been doing the last couple of weeks. I thank you so very, very much for that. And uh, trust that the Lord will set us on a discourse tonight and get us where we need to be in the Holy Ghost. Amen. How many of you like to just, just really see Jesus really do something in this house, supernatural? Amen. Amen. Praise God. How many has got the attitude like blind Bartimaeus that sat by the highway side begging? When the Bible says he saw Peter and John going to the ninth hour to prayer, and the Bible says he looked on them expecting to receive something of them. Amen. How many of you got that attitude tonight that, you know what, I don't care if this preacher can't preach and he don't do a good job, and I don't care if he's 20 minutes or 40 minutes, but tonight I'm just expecting God to do something in this house. Amen. Amen. I just, I, I just want all of us to get out of the way so the glory can come in this house. Amen. Trying to shake some of you up. I know it's Father's Day, but the Holy Ghost wants to do something for somebody in this house tonight. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to God. Amen. John, John chapter number 6. Thank you so much, Pastor, your family, all your kindness in this host church. Amen for allowing us to be part of your services. I, I am humbled, humbled by your generosity and your kindness and uh, just such a treat. Amen. To be with you and to all the saints of God, thank you for listening to me rip and snort and scream and sweat and spin and dance and shout and bout and whatever else I do up here. Amen. Amen. You know, I wish, this is what I've always said, I wish everybody could feel what a preacher feels while he's preaching Amen. in the same way. I wish you could feel literally the physical feelings that I feel on my body while I'm preaching. It make you jerk and huck and buck too. Amen. Well, maybe that needs to happen to some of us around here. Amen. Maybe... I told you I'm feeling honored. Maybe it's been way too long since it really got a good touch of the Holy Ghost on us. I'm talking where it shakes you from center to circumference, from head to toe. You feel like warm honey. Sometimes it feels like warm honey just moving down my whole body, just all over my body. I just can't help myself. You know what I'm talking about? Can I get a witness in that? Nothing like preaching with the anointing. Ain't nothing like preaching without it. Amen. Amen. I want the Holy Ghost to help us here tonight. Amen. I do feel like I got a word, so we'll just see what takes place. John chapter number six and verse number six. Amen. Pastor, I marked your Bible for you already because I'm going to have you read for me here in a little bit. So I got your, your Bible marked right there. Your, the ribbon is already marked. Amen. You can, you can read the text on whatever you want to read it on, but I need your help a little bit later. Sorry. I ain't trying to tell the pastor what to do. I'm just letting him know I'm helping him out. You, can you read it? Oh, Jesus, help us tonight. Amen. Can you read it out of the Bible? Yeah. Okay, yeah, he can read it out of his tablet, praise God. Just, just stay there after I read the text. I'm going to need your help in a little bit. Amen. Well, glory, I've already messed up. Thank God it's my last service. Hallelujah. glad you can have fun in the house of God. Amen. Amen. John chapter number six and verse number six. Amen. The Bible said here, let's begin verse six. We'll read a few verses here. And this, and this he said to prove them, for he himself knew what he would do. Amen. Jesus always has a plan. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here. There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so that the men sat down in number about 5,000. Some of the other Narratives of this account say there was 5,000 men beside women and children. Some, some theologians say 10 to 15 to 20,000 people was there that day. To every man, if there was a woman, that's 10. If they had one child, that's 15,000 people. I would say 15,000 people. So there was a big, big amount of people there, a multitude. And Jesus took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed 
to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down. And likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that nothing remain, that nothing be, that remain rather, that nothing be lost. Therefore, because of this, they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above. Everybody say over and above. That's the God that you serve. He does it over and above. He can do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think. He does over and above. He even said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Praise God for that. Amen. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle, said unto, said unto Jesus, this is of truth that the prophet should come into the world. I've come to preach to you tonight the Lord of your lunch or the Lord and your lunch. The Lord and your lunch. This is what I want us to do. I want you to put your Bibles down, and I want you just to praise God with everything inside of you for his goodness to you tonight. Would you do that? <laughs> Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God, do your work in this house. Come on, the power of the Holy Ghost is in this house tonight. Oh, hallelujah. Hey. Oh, let's give him praise right now. He's a word. you you may be seated the Lord and your lunch Jesus is real he is the Savior of the world he did come to seek and to save that which was lost he deserves all of our praise he deserves all of our worship belongs to him. There is no God like him. He is amazing. He is powerful. The prophet Isaiah in 9 and 6 penned, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. When you are sick, he can be your healer. When you are lonely, he will come by your side. For he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, but I will be with you unto the ends of the earth. When you are confused, he's a God that's not the author of confusion. And he can bring you clarity in the midst of your confusion. When you are bound in sin, he will be your deliverer. For he still sets people free from the curse and the control and the bondage of sin. His word even said, whom the son has set free is free indeed. This apostolic truth and this message of Pentecost, of the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, is not and will never be bondage. It is freedom. I thought I'd get more help than that on that. It is freedom. It is liberty. The kingdom of heaven is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. This way of living and this walk of life is not a drudge, or it should not be. It is not something that we do just to live our life through a vicious cycle, but I'm happy that I'm apostolic. I'm... I'm not looking for ways to get out of church. 
I'm not looking for ways of how close I can get to the line and compromise our doctrine or standards of holiness or righteous apostolic living or attitudes or how I live or walk or talk. I'm not trying to find a better way because there's not one. I'm not looking for a better life because there's not a better life. I'm not seeing how close I can be with friends of the world and still be in the church. But I made up my mind a long time ago. There's nothing like living for God. There's nothing like... There's nothing like worshiping God. There's nothing like praising this great healer. This great forgiver of sin, the one that was wounded for my transgression and bruised for your iniquities. And by his stripes, we are healed. Aren't you glad to be a part of the church? You shouldn't be frowned on a Sunday night. You shouldn't be unhappy and upset because they didn't sing the song you didn't like. You ought to be glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. If he never touches me, he's still a good daddy. If he never heals me, he's still a good father. If he never does anything for me, he's still worthy. And I hope I keep my garment of praise on. I hope I have it on for in place of the spirit of heaviness. Amen. Amen. But I want him also to be the Lord of my life. I want him to have complete authority and control to dictate how I live and where I go and what I do. I want him to be the Lord of my belongings and the Lord of my stuff and the Lord of my praise and the Lord of my worship and the Lord of my family. I want him to lead me and guide me into all the truth. I don't want to just feel the Holy Ghost. I want the Holy Ghost to lead me. I don't want to just experience the Holy Ghost. I want him to be a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. I want him to be the final judge and have the final say. He's still the boss. I want him to be the boss over my faith. I want him to be the boss my finances. I want him to be the boss over my family. If that's your prayer, clap your hands and give him praise. care what the devil's been lying to you and on you and ridicule you and trying to tear you down. I want you to look him in the face and say, the Lord, he is my God and he alone is my God. I will God have mercy. When he's the Lord, you won't bow to Hollywood. When he's the Lord, you won't bow to the world. When he's the Lord of your life, you won't bow to sin. You won't bow to You won't bow to jealousy. You won't bow to hatred. When he's the Lord of your life, you'll let... Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. When he's the Lord of your life, you're going to make sure everything filters through the Lord to get to you. Well, somebody say, help me, Jesus. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty. He also said, and a terrible, which regardeth not persons nor taketh reward. The Lord God, that term referring to the God of Israel, reflecting his authority. We're living in a godless society that's rebellion against all types of, of authority. Don't want nobody to tell me what to do do. Don't want nobody in control of my life. I get all that. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, there is a higher power that knows what's best for you. There is a higher power there is a higher power that knows your future, that knows what you can handle, that knows how you're living. I don't know about you, but I want God to have complete authority and control and to say so in my life. I want to be aligned with the body of Jesus Christ. I want to be improper. I want to be righteous before God. I want to be in right standing with the Lord. I want to be an obedient servant. I want to be like Thomas that 
when he said, except I see the hands and put it in and put my hands into the nails of his hands, when it was all said and done, it was Thomas that said this. When Jesus said, reach in thither and feel and see, behold my hands and reach in and thrust into my side and be not faithless. It was Thomas that said, this is what I want to be like Thomas when he said this. He said, and Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. He's still alive. He's still on the throne. He's still God alone. He's still God all by himself. He's still a healer. He's still a provider. He's still strength. He'll be your bread. He'll be your drink. He'll be your help in the midst. He'll be your peace in the midst of your storm. Because God is still God no matter what the world does. Somebody give the Lord a wave offer to praise right now. Hey, may God bless you. you. May be seated. Hey, may everybody say he's my Lord. He's but is he the Lord of your lunch? He's my Lord. But is he the Lord of your lunch? Will you read for me this gospel account, this account of Christ feeding 5,000 men with five loaves of bread and two small fishes. This miracle is remarkable. It is the only passage of the actions of Christ's life that is recorded by all four evangelists. It is, it is a great feat that God did that day where he fed 10 to 15 to maybe 20,000 people simply by five loaves of bread and two small fish. Will you read for me, Pastor Carr? And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When if Jesus you're going to be a part of this revival of what God has and this miraculous provision, you're going to have to go up and climb a little higher and find a mountain where Jesus is and be willing to take the trek and make the journey to get where you need to be with God. It's going to cost you something. You're going to have to pay a price for something. And the Bible says that they went up that mountain. Will you read for me? When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread? that these may eat. Go ahead. And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Read. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every literally, one of them. Literally, eight months of wages it would have cost them to feed that multitude. Those disciples didn't have the money. It was there that literally 200 denarii, one denarius was a day's wages of work. Eight months of finances it would take to feed the multitude that was before them there on that mountain. Even if the bread would have been available, the disciples didn't have the money to buy the bread. It was a major dilemma. But Jesus knew what he was going to do the whole time. You see, when you don't have the answers and you don't know how it's going to work out, his ways are higher than yours. His thoughts are past finding out. Come on, you may not have all the answers. You may not know the wins and the hows and the wheres. But sometimes uh, you just got to trust in God that God's got it. He's got it all under control. He's got it all under wraps. Uh, he knows exactly how he's going to do it and when he's going to do it. He's just waiting on the somebody. You're in the process of the greatest thing that God's ever done in your life. But you got to learn to wait on the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They you got to learn to say, God, I'm just going to trust you. I'm just going to believe you that you know what I need. Yeah. Hallelujah to God. So read for me. And one of his disciples, read. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, there is a lad here. I don't know if he was just going to put matters in his own hand and try to see that the multitude, he could find some food out in the audience. But he, he come across the little boy, a little lad that had a little bit of food. Read. Had five, farley, 
five barley loaves and two small fishes. He said, look, we got five, five barley loaves and two small fishes. What you need to understand about five barley loaves is we think that's a lot of food. But in those days, it wasn't. Their loaves of bread and our loaves of bread is a little bit different. Five barley loaves was enough for one person, maybe two people. And so perhaps maybe it was more kind of like these size of loaves. Just five small. The bread, the, the bread really does smell good. We, we'll get somewhere in the Holy Ghost tonight. You just got to bear with me, okay? Five, five barley loaves. He said, we got a little lad here with five barley loaves and two small fishes. Read for me. But what are they among so many? Hey, Jesus. We got a little bit of stuff here, but that, that, really ain't, that really ain't enough among so many people. Read. And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. Now that, so boy, that boy only brought what somebody provided for him to bring. He only came to that place maybe to himself to see what Jesus was doing. I don't know how he ended up, and I don't know his name, and I don't know a lot of the details. But I do know this. Somebody prepared and gave that little boy something, and he did not reject it. Reject it. Whatever was given to him by his parents or whoever the authority was over his life that handed him something, he did not reject it. And because, help me, Holy Ghost, and because he didn't reject it, he showed up at a place where Jesus needed what he did not reject. I preach it to somebody here tonight that the maybe ministry don't give to you what you want, but the ministry is giving to you what you need. And the miracle is going to be hinged on the fact, will you receive or reject what the authorities in your life has given to you? It may be in a mama that said, son, this is all I have. Go. Because five loaves of bread and two fish was the food of the poorest people in the Galilean area. But that young man, he didn't reject what mama Mama gave him or his daddy gave him or whoever his authoritarian was but he came to that place can I preach to somebody you may not always agree with your parents or your man of God but there's one thing you must never do when they bring you something from God and bring you bread for you to eat and bring you fish for you to consume you must never turn a deaf ear and close your life and close your heart up but instead you must open your mouth and say preacher it may not look good and it may not taste good but I want the bread that you provided for me You don't you dare get mad at the preacher when he's preaching in your world he's trying to give you bread he's bringing you a sack lunch he's providing something for you to be a blessing to you you better thank God for a mama that says we're going to church anyway thank God for a pastor that'll preach the word of God to you anyway thank God for some Somebody that'll worship God and be there at the church house say, come on, let's pray. Come on, let's worship. Come on, let's respond. Come on, let's give. Come on, let's be a blessing. It's the bread. It's the bread that's in your lunch. I don't know how many others in the crowd perhaps may have had something to eat, but because maybe they hit it, or because maybe they didn't have any bread. This little boy had it, but he was willing to give it. He was willing to surrender it. He was willing to give it away. He was willing to forgo the hunger pains and bypass his own desires and his own natures to survive and to live and to have food. And it was there that that lad gave his lunch and wasn't sad, evidently. He wasn't mad about it. He just surrendered it and he just gave it. I'm preaching to someone here tonight that Jesus, the Lord, wants your lunch and you've got a decision whether you're going to surrender it to him or not. It was just yesterday, Friday or Saturday, that the Holy Ghost said to me, he said he didn't have to give me his lunch. He chose to. Mark tells us that he broke the bread, but he divided the fish. Jesus broke the bread in the Jewish household. When the father broke the bread, it was done as a signal that it was now time to eat. When the Jewish father took the bread and broke the bread, it let everybody know it was time to eat. Can you imagine the crowd of all those people? Some of them probably could barely see him as they were set in 50s and groups along the hillside. 
but they looked at those five barley loaves of bread but when they seen Jesus as the father began to break that bread the crowd knew hey the dinner bells ringing hey it's about time to eat and they didn't look at the problem and they didn't look at the lack thereof but they looked at the father that was breaking the bread and any of those Jewish children knew when somebody breaks bread it's letting us know that we're about to eat I'm preaching to somebody tonight that when Jesus broke that bread literally to subdivide literally to make it into smaller pieces and smaller pieces what he started with was not what he finished with what he broke became smaller and became smaller and became smaller and what God was trying to tell us I don't need big things to use I don't need talented people per se I don't need people that have giftings that are amazing that are smart and that are awesome but I wonder that he was thinking about himself as the bread of life being broken for all humanity as he broke that bread that day I hope this is okay we'll clean it up afterwards but as that father began to break that bread because a little boy those people ate because the little boy understood that the Lord is the Lord of his lunch, that the Lord is the Lord of his possessions. Let's talk tonight about your lunch. It's not five loaves and two fishes, but your lunch is your life. It is your talent. It is your time. It is your treasure. Help me tonight, Holy Ghost. It's your worship. It's your church attendance. It's your dedication to God. It's when you clap your hands. It's when you lift your hands. It's when you read the word. It's when you pay your tithes. What are you saying? You're saying the world is not getting my lunch. Jesus is the Lord of my lunch. Jesus is my provider. You say, preacher, all I have it's five loaves of bread and two small fishes. I remind you what Paul told the church of Corinth when he said, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound, meaning to bring to shame or dishonor or to fail to respect the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised that God chosen yea and things that are not to bring to naught the things that are why that no flesh should glory in his presence Jesus never once mentioned that lad when he fed the multitude he never once there in the face of those people said hey everybody you ought to thank God you ought to thank God for the lad. No, 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 no. He didn't draw attention to that boy because no flesh should glory in his presence. You may feel like tonight that your lunch is not much. You may feel like you don't have much to offer or to give or you're not worth anything and your self-worth is so low. Can I tell you those suicidal thoughts that you've been thinking are not yours. Those suicidal thoughts that's been entering your mind are not yours. They are sent from hell to destroy and take the lunch that's in your hands that belongs to the Lord. Because the devil knows you're about ready to take your lunch and give it to Jesus because you want him I just believe that the Holy Ghost wants to use somebody. It might as well be me and it might as well be you that God would use our love I 
I remind you you're worth so much that Jesus died for you. I defy the lies of a suicidal thought that says you're not worth living, young person. You better hear this preacher here tonight. That battling of the spirit of suicide is a lie from the pits of hell. Your life is worth more. You are more valuable. You are more precious in the sight of God than anything else in the world. You are his son and you are his daughter. There is a lad here tonight. Oh, will somebody clap your hands and praise God like you mean it right now. Your mama has put in your hands. Your mama called the church. Has put something in your lunch pail that God's wanting you to surrender back to him. It's invested in something in you that you'll give your life to God and be somebody for the Lord Jesus Christ. Young lady and young man, hear me tonight. What you have in your lunch is enough for the Lord to use. He uses small things. Did you hear what I said? The Lord uses small things. He uses things like a rod. It's when the Lord has your lunch that Moses can stand with the rod in his hand at the Red Sea and the waters depart. It's when the Lord can use a rod. It's when the Lord can take a job on See, when the Lord's got your lunch, you can take a jawbone and kill a thousand Philistines. When the Lord has your lunch, you can be like a David that you picked up five stones, but all you needed was one stone and one name to take out one Goliath in the valley of Elah. Because when the Lord has your lunch, you are more powerful, you are more useful to the kingdom of God. I'd rather have somebody with no lunch than somebody that has a lunch that'll give it to the world. Come on, God didn't save you. God God didn't, ra- God didn't raise you up uh, just to sit on a Pentecostal pew. God brought you out of the world uh, so he could use you in this end time harvest uh, to reach the world for his name's sake. <laughs> Woo! Five, just, just five loaves and two small fishes. But when the Lord has your lunch, uh, 5,000 men will eat. And, and beside women and children, when the Lord has your lunch, it's when a Noah will build an ark to the saving of his family. He'll tell everybody the flood is coming. Why would a man do that? Because whatever was in Noah, he gave it to the Lord. Because the Lord was the Lord of his lunch. And he built that ark, and the flood did come. But oh, Noah and his wife, and Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, and their wives were spared because the daddy said he's the Lord I hope I'm making sense here tonight he's the Lord of my life he's a, it don't make sense but he's worthy of all of my praise it don't make sense but he's the Lord of my life it's an Abel that offers up to God an acceptable sacrifice because the Lord is going to get his lunch somewhere in the Holy Ghost tonight. It's the children of Israel willing to walk around the walls of Jericho and they witnessed the walls falling down flat because the Lord had their lunch and they just obeyed it with obedience under the man of God and they seen a miracle that God did for them. It was them that, it was what about Rahab tonight? She was willing to hide the messengers and she perished not with them that believed not but to the saving of her family and her household Why? Because the Lord had Rahab's lunch and she gets in lineage with Jesus Christ. I've come to preach here tonight. Don't let the devil have your lunch. When he's got your lunch, you'll rebel against authority. You'll say your preacher don't understand when the devil's got your lunch. Do it your own way. That's just the flesh. The flesh is eating your lunch. Come on, this world wants your lunch and it wants to trade you. But when that lad came to that deal and he surrendered his lunch, he didn't ask for anything in return. Here it is. You can have it. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll preach, but I want, I want the pulpit. Come on. Come on. Give me a little 
tight up in here tonight, but if it's tight, it's right. That's what my people all used to say. Well, I, I'll, I'll give my talent to the Lord, but I, I want to I wanna be in the limelight. I want to be seen, not the little boy. The little boy just wanted to give his, his lunch unto the Lord and, and just surrender it to the Lord. You see, when your identity is wrapped up in social media and you can't live a day without posting something on social media, social media has your lunch. Get a little pride up in here. That's okay. That's perfectly okay. I don't want the world to control and manipulate. There's young people that feel like they have no friends and they're worthless and their self-worth is, is lower than ever. But they got thousands of friends on social media and they think nobody loves them. Why? Because they're giving all their lunch to the social media world instead of giving it to God that died for them and that loves them and that cares for them. Somebody give him praise right now. Lord, help me. When the Lord has your lunch, you'll have a call to God in your life, and you'll fulfill that call. But when you give yourself to the flesh and give yourself to your own desires, your dreams and your visions will outweigh what the Lord wants to do in your life. All right. All right. Recently at a meeting, and uh, is it okay if I tell a few stories tonight? I, I was recently at a meeting, and in this meeting, the Holy Ghost is moving. God was doing all kinds of awesome things in that service. And there was a young man about 19, 20 years old that, that I knew from years ago at a church that I used to attend. We were there at the end of that service, and there was a, there was a call of God that was going forth in that service, a call to ministry, a call. I thank God for those of you getting degrees. And, man, that was so awesome a couple of weeks ago. But we still need preachers. You know why there's not more preachers and more churches? It's because the world has our lunch. I got stirred up in here tonight, but but anyhow, amen. And I, I was there in that meeting, and all of a sudden something hit me, and I looked over at this young man. His name is Tegan, and I said, Tegan, you've been chasing dreams. You've been doing your own thing, and there's a call of God in your life to be a man of God and to be a preacher. I wasn't calling him. I was confirming the call of God that was in his life. He began to shake uncontrollably, and tears streaming down his face, and his daddy, who's a preacher, went over to him, and he buried his face in his daddy's, his daddy's arms, and his daddy's lap uh, because there was something going on uh, in that boy. He was chasing an acting career and going to college down the road uh, just doing his own thing. Uh, one of my friends told me after that service uh, he said I went to eat with him uh, and he said I got to make some changes. Uh, he said I've been chasing a dream. Uh, I've been after a dream. Uh, you see when, the, when your dreams has your lunch uh, the devil's going to strip you and rob you and you're never going to be anything for God. Uh, but when you turn that thing around and when you say Lord I ain't got much to offer but I got a little bit of loaves I'm just gonna here it is you can have my five loaves and, and my two small fish if you can use me if you can use anything Lord you can use me take what I am take what I'm not and use it for your glory Amen. Amen. And I remember God changed his life and God did tremendous things in this world. You didn't quit letting the devil bully you and take your lunch. I know tonight I may be elementary to some of us here tonight, but I'm preaching to somebody. Quit letting the devil take from you the things that God has put in you for his kingdom and for his purpose. Quit letting the devil rob you and strip you of the things and the talents and time and treasure that you can give to the kingdom of God in these last days. Is the Lord the Lord of your lunch? Are you willing to give your little bit to God? God, I don't have much, but I'm willing to surrender it. I'm willing to give it to the Lord. I preach to a single person here tonight that you've been waiting on a spouse. You've been hungry. You've been thirsty after God, but you're about ready to make a bad decision. I preach to you tonight. Don't let some ungodly boyfriend or ungodly girlfriend take your lunch, but you better make up your mind. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to wait on the Lord. I'm going to wait till Jesus says, okay, I'm ready to receive your lunch. I'm ready to have. I'm ready to bless you. Uh, Jesus' name. It belongs to the Lord. My life is not my own. I've been purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not my own. I've got to surrender my lunch and my life to God.
every tree, he said to Adam. He told him, Adam commanded, was commanded by God. The first commandment in the Bible, the first time the word command rather is mentioned is about what man would consume. He said, of every tree of the garden you must free, you can freely eat. He said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat it for the day that you eat of it. Thereof you shall die. And then the Bible says that after that, after he addressed what man could consume, then he addressed man's loneliness. He said, first, you got to make sure there's some things you don't eat, or some things that you don't have, or some things you cannot become a partaker of. And then he said, I want to address your loneliness. For he said, it's not good for man to be alone. I want to tell someone here tonight that your loneliness that you've been struggling with as a single adult and that you've lived your life up to this point waiting for a spouse and trying to do it what's right. I want you to know that the things you consume are it going to impact whether God sends you a help meet or not. You cannot rebuke what you entertain. And if you're consuming porn and consuming ungodly things and you're living your life with guilt and shame and unhealthy media con I hope I'm still in apostolic church tonight. You're consuming unhealthy media content and you're viewing things and giving yourself to lust and perversion and you want God to help your loneliness and you're spending all your time playing video games and it's getting into the point where you're addicted all the time. I know a little bit's okay and young people play it, that's fine. But don't live your life just to do whatever you want to do. There's this thing called the church that Jesus purchased that you're a part of. You need to surrender it all to him. Lay it all down at the altar and give it all to Jesus. wants what you have to offer but don't give it to the world the devil wants what you possess but don't give it to the devil your flesh may be satisfied of the pleasures of sin for a season but before Moses ever lifted up his rod he gave God his lunch when he said I refuse to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and I'd rather suffer the affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season when the Lord has your lunch you don't want the world you don't want to live in the world you don't want to live like the devil and do whatever you want to do you're surrendered to God you've already given your life to God and once you've given your life to God there's nothing in the world like living for God and serving God and be dedicated to the Lord it was, it was Moses that surrendered his life of insufficiency when he still went to Pharaoh and said let my people go when you've got a surrendered life, there'll be boldness come on you and you'll speak words of life to people and you'll see people be set free. You'll win souls to God. I hope I'm preaching prophetically tonight. I hope I'm preaching the spirit and the heart of someone here tonight. When the Lord has your lunch, you're going to witness Jesus doing something new. He had never done what he'd done that day, but when a little lad surrendered what he had and gave it to the Lord, God did a new thing. also see miracles then you will see the joy of the hunger the hungry people being satisfied when you are ready and willing to surrender your lunch to the Lord instead of saying to Andrew no my mama my mama gave me this lunch my mama prepared for me these five loaves of bread and I'm not going to let you have it instead of saying no the little boy just said okay you can have my lunch Instead of rejecting and refusing to be a part of the process, he was just a lad. There's a lad here with five loaves of bread and just two small fish. And you feel like your life is worthless. And you feel like there's no hope in your future and that God can't use you. The devil is alive! 
that thief that come and buffer to steal, kill, and destroy. I defy the lies of hell tonight that says God don't want your lunch. God is after your lunch. He wants your lunch to be a blessing to 5,000 people, young lad. Every time that bread was broken, it was another miracle. Every time he broke the bread, it was another miracle. Every time he broke the bread, it was another miracle. Can you imagine that boy that came with just five loaves after he ate his seventh or eighth or, or tenth little loaf of bread? After he ate four or five or six or eight fish, I wonder if he said, you know what? What I gave up was nothing compared to what I got. What I surrendered was nothing compared to what I got. What I gave up uh, to have the Lord use. What I surrendered. What I surrendered to God was nothing compared to what the Lord let me put to my lips and what the Lord let me taste and what the Lord let me experience. I come here and just had some barley bread, but the burden bearer broke that bread and I started eating and I kept on eating. Can you imagine that lad going back home and mama saying, hey boy, I bet you're hungry now. I didn't give you much to eat. No, mama, I'm still full. Boy, you should be hungry. I, I know you're hungry. I didn't give you very much to eat today. No, mama, I'm still full. Well, how are you full? Mama, I went with five loaves and two small fish. But I watched as more than 5,000 people ate off my five loaves. And my mama, you know what happened? He's the Lord of my lunch. Mama, he's the Lord of my lunch. Mama, he's the Lord of my lunch. Mama. Mama, he made up the difference. He kept multiplying and kept on blessing and kept on. Mama, it was amazing. You should have been there, Mama. You should have got a bite too. You should have experienced. Oh, I wish somebody praised him right now. Somebody love the Lord all over this house. surrender. Let there be a lad that will say not my will but yours. Let a lad say I only got five loaves pastor. My daddy's not a preacher. My mama's not in the church but let it be a middle aged man. If there's a call of God on your life that you've been running from. You're doing your own thing fulfilling your own dreams and God said all I want is your five loaves. All I need is your two small fish. I want to be the Lord of your lunch. I want to be the Lord over your lives. I wish you could be seated. I wish, I wish that you could have sat with me at the table that I sat at. I wish that you could have joined in to the conversation that I was a part of. I want to tell you, throw the picture of the Christman family up there. I, I wish that I could I wish that I could have transplanted you and taken you back to the moment where it all happened. I want to tell you an amazing story. This is the Christman family that they pastor in Ohio. They're out of Aaron Bounds Church, the Anchor Church. They pastor one of the campus churches there. It's, it's amazing what God did. It was the father, Brother Josh Christman, who was driving down the road seeing the Anchor Church sign. He's seen it and it moved him and stirred him. He walked into that church. He had from a denominal upbringing. Actually, he was a preacher of a denominal church, but he walked in that meeting, and Bishop Aaron Bounds was preaching about Jesus' name, baptism, and the mighty God in Christ, and the oneness of God. Long story short, he receives a revelation of truth. He got there, the Lord, hallelujah. He gave his lunch to the Lord. He surrendered his false doctrine and turned it all in for apostolic truth. He turned in his junk food for the bread which cometh down from heaven. God have mercy. He turned his life around and they started coming. They started growing. They started growing in the Lord. But what's so amazing about them is their daughters were very heavily evolved, very heavily evolved in gymnastics. Matter of fact, every day they would drive over an hour to Columbus, Ohio to train for six hours a day. They would do their homeschool on the way and do their homeschool in between their practices when they would have 
that breaks. They lived their life day after day after day. That's what they did. But God began working on them. And one by one, all the daughters quit gymnastics except Skylar. She's in the picture. You're looking left of her father. It's Skylar. And she, she did not quit. She kept doing it. She was very good being trained by Olympian coaches there in Columbus, Ohio. They were very talented, not just some average athletic people, but they were very athletic, very talented, very gifted. Matter of fact, coaches' eyes were on some of them. that They would move up the ranks, and who knows what could have happened. But Jesus got involved. But I sat with them as I preached there and so in their church. And, and I, I, got, I got kind of the story of what had happened. And it was just an amazing story how many of them had quit, but Skylar had not. But God got to dealing with Skylar. And on a nightly basis, uh, her oldest sister, the, the pretty girl, the red hair with the glasses there on the end, they're all beautiful family. Well, I mean, come on, they're just gay, but they're just good looking family. But the one there on the end, the oldest, uh, she would have to listen to Skylar every night, cry herself to sleep as the Lord began to deal with her to give up gymnastics and just surrender it all. The Lord was wanting her lunch. All right. And she would listen to her sister every night cry herself to sleep for several nights. And Skylar wanted to quit but she felt like she would let her mom down and didn't want her mom to know because she was so talented. But she didn't know that mama was on a seven day fast. She had no idea that her mama was calling out to God. They didn't want it to be their decision. They wanted their daughter to say, I don't want to do it anymore. And instead of making them quit, they wanted it to be their decision to quit and say they took it to God and they took it to prayer. I wish you could feel what I feel right now. She got to deal, God got to deal with her. And finally, she told her mama, she said, Mama, I want to quit gymnastics. Her mama was excited. They were so happy and so elated because her mom had been fasted that God would do that for her. But I sat there after I preached for him one service, and we sat around the table, and I said, Skylar, will you tell me my story? Brother Josh Christman, her father, said she's not publicly told it to anybody because it's just such a, such a tender, sentimental thing to her and so real just the God experience with her I sat there across from that table and she began to relate the story to me with tears streaming down her face you know what I was hearing I was hearing the ruffle of a lunch pail I was hearing a young lady saying Lord I want you to be the Lord of my lunch I was hearing a young lady saying God all I had was a little bit of talent all I had my chance for success was on the line but I listened to a story of a young lady that said God I don't want to live my life like that God I want to be a part of the kingdom of God and I Pastor Carr, I got to smell the bread that she surrendered. I got to see firsthand a young teenage girl that said, I want the Lord to be the Lord of my lunch. She quit gymnastics, and now they have a powerful apostolic church in Ohio where she's helping her mom and dad build, and there's revival, and there's a move of God. What do you preach? I'm telling you, when the Lord becomes the Lord of your lunch, uh, there's some things that don't matter anymore. There's just some stuff that just don't matter anymore. What was important before is no longer important now. Her dad, he sat there, he and he, he never heard her even tell it out publicly. He sat there, and that man of God, he began to cry. It was in Ruby Tuesdays. I'll never forget it as we sat there. And what I was witnessing, I was witnessing a young lady that was surrendered all to the Lord. I was witnessing a young lady that crawled upon the altar and said, Not my will. This may not be popular preaching tonight, but I'm after somebody. She crawled upon that altar, and she said, Not my will. But your will be done. Somebody lift your hands and love the Lord right now.
When the Lord, the Lord of your lunch, you'll say no. When your flesh is saying yes. When the Lord's the Lord of your lunch, you'll spend all your life saying, God, what do you want me to do? It's just five loaves of bread. It's just two small fish. What do you want me to do with it, God? Here I am, Lord. Here I am with just, just my five loaves and my two small insignificant fish. No, God, you surely you can't use me. Yes, he can. There's no way, God, I can have a dramatic call and an awesome part of my life be totally changed around. Yes, he can do it for you. I was in, I'm trying to hurry to a close. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry for preaching so long, but I am trying to hurry. Everybody got time for one more story? No, really, you really got time for one more story. I've, I've been in transition for uh, a year and a half. The Holy Ghost started dealing with me back in 18 that, that I need to, to uh, make a transition as far as a church. And so I started making this transition. And, and uh, at that time, we were based in a church in southeastern Oklahoma. It's about 45 minutes from where we lived. And so when we were not preaching somewhere, we'd have, I mean, it's crazy to have an hour and a half on the road on a Wednesday night, you know. And, and that wasn't the reason for our transition. I'd gotten into some battles, preaching some overseas stuff. I was having some health issues, and, and I just felt the Holy Ghost start dealing with me I, that I needed to transition to another church. And so in March of, of 2019, a district conference in, in Dell City, Oklahoma, at Calvary Christian Center, the Holy Ghost spoke to me twice, back-to-back -back nights, that I was to come there for a season under Bishop Paul Sharp and Pastor Jason Sharp. That was March of 19. We put our house up for sale. It just, it seemed like it took forever. You know what I'm talking about. I'm smelling what I'm stepping in. Hallelujah. And uh, so I, we put it up for sale. We knew it was God's will, but man, nothing was moving. The devil fought us tooth and nail. Every decision and every choice, I felt like I was an uphill battle trying to do everything I could. But I was just standing there like a little boy saying, God, here's my five loaves and here's my two small fish. Wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, here I am. Here I am. Send me. Here I am. Here I am. Send me. We kept on fighting through it, kept on pushing through it. Finally, things started shaping up. Things started working. My wife was miserable. She couldn't stand that God was plucking the feathers, you know, getting us uncomfortable. We had to make a transition. I mean, she was crying. She was just, she was just kind of a, a mess. I was a mess. My kids were a mess. We, we were, were in the throes of it. We were, we were in the middle of it, man. It, was, it wasn't easy. Transition is never easy. But when you're transitioning in the will of God, there's nothing like it in all the world. He will lead you and guide you. He will direct your paths in your footsteps. He knows where you need to be. He knows where you need to be. Though his word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. I remember going through all the emotional things and all the things you're having to deal with and all the things uprooting your family and moving and transitioning. All these things are going on in your mind. I remember... It was an awesome, awesome thing. We got a, we got a contract, and we sold, we sold our house on my daughter's 10th birthday. It's pretty cool. Then we got our contract on our other house on my wife's birthday. Don't tell me God's not in control of your life. So we were, we were in the middle of this transition, and I, I was keeping Bishop in, in the loop, was trying to find a house. Once we, we were looking, we looked for 8 to 10 months. We couldn't find a house. We wanted to be so many minutes from the airport, so many minutes from the church, and, and living in the metro area in Oklahoma City, that can be hard. And so we were looking, we were searching, man, I was, I was looking at every rock, making every phone call. You guys know I'm doing everything I know, I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm doing everything that I know, doing nothing was working out. Finally, a house come on the market that had not been on the market. It had been on the market for a while, it got off the market. Then when it come back on the market, it come back on the market considerably lower. And so we, I told my wife, I said, honey, when you go look at this house, matter of fact, if we don't, if we don't move on this house, it'll sell by this weekend. I had my, a realtor guy in my church that he owns a real estate company, and I showed him the house. He knew of the house, and he seen the major price drop. The people that owned the house, they were building a brand new one. The builder said, hey, your house is about done. You better get in gear. You better sell the house. 
So I don't know if their other deal fell through or what happened, but they got the house relisted, and we went to see it. It was on a Thursday. I'll never forget. We walked there. It was everything that we wanted. Everything was good. But the only problem was it was five minutes too far from the distance we wanted from the church. Five minutes. And so I called Bishop Sharp. He was in California at a meeting. And, and uh, I, I said, hey, hey, Bishop, I want to see. I sent him the house, sent him the info. Amen. I just believe in getting covering and protection. Running. I'm not saying you need to run everything through your man of God, whatever your bishop, pastor preaches, whatever. But for me, as a man of God, coming under a new covenant and to a new church and to a new area, I wanted God's protection. And I wanted the man of God's approval of whatever I'm doing. Hell, glory, hallelujah. hallelujah. And so I, I, uh, I said, Bishop, got this house. And I said, help me pray about it, this and that. And, and uh, you know, he just, he, he, he took forever, kind of in my mind, to get back to me. It didn't, it wasn't that long, but it seemed like a lot. I'm sitting in the church, I'm sitting in the house ready to make an offer. Because by making the offer, even at what they're asking for it, I'm stepping into a house where I'm instantly, instantly have 125,000 equity, just like that. Because the price dropped there. It's it just a miracle. It's just a miracle. So I'm sitting there waiting. I'm saying, I'm there with my realtor. We're there. My family's there. We're waiting. We're waiting. Okay. Well, Bishop hadn't responded. Our time to view the house was up. We had to leave. We go down the road. We're driving down the road. Bishop called. He said, he said Brother Burns, he said, uh, he said I, don't, I don't have a piece about that house. I just, I just, for whatever reason, I just don't feel good about it. I'm thinking, We've been looking for 10 months, and there's not another house out there. And this is a still of a deal, and my wife wants it, and I want it, and the kids, and man, it's just amazing. And, and the man of God don't have a piece about it. He said, Brother Burns, he said, uh, he said, you know, he said, if you want to buy the house, you can buy it. But I just, I just don't have a piece about it. He said, I'll give you my blessing, but I just don't have a piece about it. What am I going to do? some peers. I, I was like, God, if this, is, this a, is this a test? Is this a test that I've got to pass that, you know, I'm, I'm going to this new authority and this new pastor and bishop and, and is, it, is he just, are you just testing me here to see what I'm going to do? And God, you know, you know, you told me to come here. I didn't ask to come here. You told me to come here. So he's going back and forth and man, I was calling my buddies and it was like, Shane, you know, I've seen this kind of stuff happen before you. Do whatever, and I, I just, I took, my wife said, take me home, take me back to the motor home. She went, to, she went to bed, she didn't want to go eat, she was crying, she was hysterical, because all of her hopes and all of her dreams and all this thing that we knew where God wanted us to go, and it seemed like we hit another door, and it seemed like we, hit, I'm talking to somebody, I know we're not screaming holler, but I'm talking to somebody right now in the Holy Ghost, that you're doing everything you can do to do God's will, and it seems like everything you're doing, nothing's working out. That doesn't mean it's not God's will, you keep on pressing on. You keep on pressing on. You keep on moving towards the mark. Press toward the mark of the high calling of Christ Jesus. You keep on believing your steps are ordered by the Lord. You keep on trusting God through the process. And I remember standing outside my motor home and I'm hurting musicians. Come on back. Give them hope. I'm trying to wrap this up. I remember standing outside my motor home and I was there on the phone. I was there talking to people and I, I just said, you know what? I'm not going to consider that house. It wasn't five loads. It was just five minutes. It was just five minutes too far from the church. Because I had said I wanted to be 20 minutes from the house of God. But when you give the Lord your lunch, my bishop told me, he said, that's the hardest thing I've ever had to tell somebody. It's absolutely no. He's like, I just don't feel peace about it. He said, I, I battled and war within my spirit all day long. He said, and you know what? God provides us another house that's way better, that we like way more, that's closer, way closer than the other church, than the other one was to the church. The kids love it. We love it more and more every day. We've only been in there a few weeks. But God, it was the only other house we could consider. There was no other options with our price range and where we was going. That's what happens when you say, the Lord is the Lord of my lunch. And if pastor said no and he don't have a piece about it, I'm just going to submit to authority because I've learned that the anointing flows down. 
I'm preaching to somebody right now that you made decisions uh, when you knew it wasn't right. You can still get it right, and you can come under that covering uh, and under that blessing, uh, and you know that God is in control uh, of your situation. There's a lad here tonight. Uh, I don't know where you are, and I hope I preach not too long, uh, but there's somebody in this house that says, you know what? I've just disagreed with pastor on several fronts. And there's some things that have been bothering me. There's some things that I don't like. But tonight, I'm going to take my five loaves. Tonight, I'm going to take my five loaves and my two small fish. And I'm just going to put them on the altar. And I'm going to say, Lord, I don't understand everything. I don't know why, but I'm going through what I'm going through. But there's one thing certain, Lord. I'm not giving my lunch to anybody else or to any other thing. But God, I'm going to surrender it at the altar. And I'm going to say, here it is, Lord. Here it is. When things don't make sense. When it's so hard and so difficult. Here it is. I'm going to give it all to you, Lord, because you're the Lord of my life. Come on, let's talk to the Lord for a moment. This service is ending a little bit different than what I thought, but God's working on some hearts in this room right now. Uh, is there a Tegan in this house that you've been chasing your dreams? There's a call of God on your life. Is there a Skyler in this house that you're doing your own thing? Mom and Daddy's trying to reach for you, but you're just doing your own thing. Is there somebody like myself that's faced with the decision? Do I submit and yield to the man of God in my life, or I just do whatever I want to do? Let's talk to the Lord for a moment right now. I want you, Lord, to be the Lord of my lunch. Somebody open your mouth and talk to the Lord for a moment. There needs to be surrender. Dying at the altar is not pretty. But if God can somehow do something in the hearts of people in this room. Come on, you're battling with yourself. Do, am I going to give that Am I going to surrender that to the Lord? Not my will, God. Not my will, Lord, but yours. Not my will, but yours. Jesus, help us tonight, Lord. Help us, God. I tried it my own way, Lord. I did it my own way, but tonight, God, I'm going to surrender it to you. I'm coming. I'm coming, God to the multitudes I'm going to preach my first sermon I'm going to win my first soul I'm going to teach my first Bible study I'm going to reach out to somebody that's lost I'm going to give up my career I'm going to give up my life I'm going to lay down my life for the things of God because my life is not my own if you can use anything Lord you can use me take my life Lord take my Take my lunch. Oh, God. Is there a lad here, a young man or a young lady? Is there a mama? Is there a daddy? Is there a grandma or a grandpa? I'd like to find a place to pray. Say, Lord, I want you to be the Lord of my lunch. Say, preacher, I've been hurt. I'm sorry. Let the Lord be the Lord of your lunch. Preacher, I'm confused. I'm sorry. Let the Lord be the Lord of your lunch. Here it is, God. Here it is. God, I don't want to chase after my own thing in my own ways. I want to find myself at an altar. Saying, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. Not my will, God, but yours be done. Not my will, Lord.
asking this apostolic church to cry out to the Lord all over this house. In the balcony, in the pews, wherever you are, I'm asking you to lift your voice to the Lord. Here I am, God. Here I am. Here I am. Here I am. Oh, somebody lift your voice to the Lord right now and surrender. God, I give all my life to you. I give all my heart to you, Lord. I just lay it down at the altar tonight. Jesus can hear your words, Lord. Here's my life. Here's my life. I give my life to you. I live my life selfishly. I've done what I've wanted to do. I've chased my dreams, but no more. I'm dying at the altar of commitment, of sacrifice, of surrender. I give it all to you tonight, God. I give it all to you tonight. I need somebody to help me lift your voice in this place. I need somebody to cry out to the Lord for these people that have filled these altars. Myself, I give myself to you. 